segundo día de Moda World Congress empezamos la cobertura de los tres paneles que tenemos planeados para hoy. En este caso vamos a tra tratar el tema de Wi-Fi, eh, Carrier Class, Carrier Grade o Wi-Fi para operadores. Lo vamos a hacer en inglés. Y nos acompañan Thorn Bjorn de la empresa Aptilo y nos acompaña también Tiago, a quien ya conocen del Wireless Broadband Alliance, WBA o WVA, como quieran llamarle. Eh, que ya algunos de ustedes incluso lo conocen personalmente por algunos workshops que ha hecho de la semana en América Latina. Uh, Thorn Bjorn, uh, Tiago. Welcome to the Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, you very much. Taking the challenge of uh, being in this uh, little panel. Okay. okay, so let's discuss very quickly uh, sure. for our audience. Hotspot.2.0. Yeah, uh, what's the status? I know you are drawing, uh, doing some trials on your stand, and probably you are participating in those. Uh, so please just uh, tell us. Yeah, very quick. Thank, you. Thank you so much, uh, Rafael. So, On the Hotspot 2.0, we have been seeing a huge pickup from not only the vendor community with the certification of equipment, both infrastructure equipment and device uh, user equipment. The latest stats that I got from Wi-Fi Alliance, we have today over uh, 450 devices certified. 450. 450. Certified with the Hotspot Auto, that is called in fact Passpoint certification, that is the official name from Wi Fi Alliance. And for those 450, around 280 are end user devices, so smartphones, tablets, and mobile phones. Um, as you mentioned, we have a demo here in Mobile World Congress about the full implementation of Hotspot Auto. We have 15 carriers from all over the world, companies like China Mobile, AT&T, um, Portugal Telecom, Comcast, they are all using the infrastructure of Hotspot at all. When you're saying full implementation means that I can get it with my handset and do the handover between 3G or LTE to Wi-Fi? Or no, you can pick up your device and it basically, if your device is compatible and is Hotspot at all, Uh, okay. Certified, ready. You just automatically connect to the network. You don't okay. need to touch anything. You don't need to put any username. You cannot. You don't need to do anything. And basically, we have two types of authentication: or the SIM card authentication, and uh, for the cable operators like Comcast, is a certificate. Okay. So is the called IPTTLS authentication. So in WBI, we have been seeing a lot of. Uh, adoption by our carriers. Uh, in fact, in the US, we are starting to see the first full deployments in some large venues, like Los Angeles Airport is one of the large venues that is full hotspot to auto compliant. So we are starting to see commercial deployments in, in, in reality becoming. Okay, what is your role, uh, Aptilo's role, in this trial? What are you providing or what, what is your offering? make sure that this can work? Sure. Um, what we've been doing Hotspot 2.0 trials for, for quite a while. We're not involved in this specific one, but we've done it with, with Telia, which is a customer of ours, and Swisscom, and that's all around the, the original aspects of, just like you said, being able to pull out the device, and then the device looks around what kind of networks, and then automatically starts authenticating with the SIM card, for instance. And, and the key aspects of what's in Hotspot 2.0 for that seamless thing is something that we're having commercial deployments in, in some 7, 10 different operators. And I think actually one of the largest is in, in, in Scandinavia, we tell you, then they have a tremendous amount of access points and they're all enabled with uh, SIM authentication and uh, as well as in Swisscom and others, even in Taiwan, several doing that. And it's a tremendous impact in terms of usage. If we look at the amount of devices they have that can do this, you're almost seeing a 95% take rate of people that actually automatically connect, even though they don't know about it. Okay. They walk down the street Which is the, and, and they the look idea. at, and that's the ideal, and then it exactly. connects. It's beautiful. Okay, now let, let me ask you, I'm going to throw some con controversy here, yeah. uh, and, and uh, you probably have different perspectives. I, I've read a report on the press, on international press, about the hotspot or the passpoint uh, technology or, or option of, of doing the authentication. And it seems that some people say it's going to take like four or five years to actually be really deployed worldwide. And that another alternatives provided by companies like Aptilo or mm -hmm. any other mm -hmm. Wi-Fi providers would be used longer 
for a long time. Yeah. I don't know if this is true or for, because for what you're saying now, it seems that hotspot to the row is already almost here. And I'm seeing this debate. I don't know if this debate is just something that I picked up from a, uh, an unreliable source, which I don't think so. I think <laughs> the publication error was quite, quite well known. Uh, but I don't know if that's, that's the case or do you think it's, it's just uh, uh, journalistic uh, exercise? <laughs> <laughs> I think the key aspect is that Hotspot 2.0 is a great effort by the industry to try to encapsulate a lot of different key things, what to be done. And I think by looking at that, they've taken a number of things that were already working, such as SIM authentication. And there's another couple of aspects where username password called EEP TTLS and the certificate-based EEP TLS. And some of those have already been used in an enterprise environment. So that's a way to sort of, for the device to authenticate, identify itself, and then get access. But then there are other aspects around this on the 82.11U and all that, and also later on around the roaming and next generation hotspot. Some of those enhanced aspects will take a little bit longer time to get rolling. I think, I think that's probably one of the key things. So from, from what you're saying, Diego, yeah, perhaps you can address this. Uh, the hotspot 2.0 implementation is kind of on the faces, so you can implement yeah. the authentication. Then, uh, yeah, that's true. That, so uh, if you will look to the standard of of hotspot 2.0, is a combination of different features. Okay. So you can implement it everything at once. You can. You can. Uh, you, could. you can implement everything at once, or you can pick up, by whatever reason, I prefer just start with Ipsim authentication. Okay. It's better by my, for my network, it's better by, for my strategy, for my business case, so I go with Ipsim only. So, but um, we see, like, um, talking on what's saying, we see a lot of different approaches to Wi-Fi, and I think that is the the magic of this technology. There is no single business case that will work for everyone. So we see so many different deployments, so many different requirements, so many different types of companies. We see on our organization, so large telecommunication companies like China Mobile, AT&T, and then we see this small IT company that is managing a couple of spots that are in very well and known locations like a big airport or a big football stadium. And because they manage that location, they become really important for everyone. And all the, the, the industry, they want to partner with them and work with them. So it's, I think it's part of the essence of Wi-Fi to have this capacity of bringing different approaches, different business cases to the table. And because of that, we have these different technology deployments on, on the industry. Anyway, now, uh, based on what you're saying, and something that probably I, I didn't know well in terms of these different kind of, uh, you know, areas that you can implement yeah. to reach that yeah. full hotspot to the road. How much is in the hands of the operator and how much is in the hands of the handset manufacturer to reach a full implementation. How many things can the operator control to decide, okay, I'm going to implement uh, these three areas of the hotspot, to leave those two out, yeah. and how much that decision is based on, okay, what type of access do I have on, on my uh, market? It, it, th there's, there's a lot of flexibility for both the operator and the devices. And if we take the example of, as you mentioned, the authentication piece, where it is fairly straightforward today is for an operator to say, this is my network, this is how I'm deploying it, and these are my subscribers. And then enhance it. And I can, for instance, in the case of Apple, I can talk to Apple and send down over the air to all my iPhones and, and anything, anybody that has a SIM card and has an iOS device, this is my SSID, this is my system name. This is the one that you should automatically connect to. What is not in place today is how do I, in a good way, automatically send down to all my existing devices that this is the name of my network because they can't receive that in a good way. And that's where it falls into the hands of the devices. And the other aspect is, well, this is what I can do in my network, but what if I want my handsets to freely know in advance what other networks it should automatically connect to? And that's another challenge a little bit, getting some of this information down to the device. Yeah, what I can mention is, definitely there is a huge effort in the industry as a whole, mm -hmm. really to combine all these different perspectives, 
and this flexibility that Torbjorn was talking about. If, if I want just to implement one of the pieces, I can do it, or um, I can plan on a roadmap of different deployments. But there is another perspective very important that is the business case and strategy from the operator. We see from our members, <coughs> operators that are looking to Wi-Fi just for the local market, for example, as an offload strategy, as a, a network optimization strategy, and then we have others that look to Wi-Fi more as an international offer. Roaming, yeah, Roaming yeah, yeah. so I want to deliver a better service abroad to my customers. So, and depending on your strategy, and if you see to, just to these two examples, you can just pick up parts of the technologies to deliver better that strategy. You don't need to implement everything, depending on your business case. Okay. Now you mentioned uh, the fact that the, I, the iOS devices can have this over the air. Mm. Does that mean that Android and Windows Phone are still a bit behind in, in that regard, or they have more fragmentation in terms of some devices could, some other devices couldn't? There, there is there is a larger fragmentation. There is a reality. If you just take a look at the status today in the market. There are a number of operators that have great success of using the piece of Hotspot 2.0 that is eSIM or SIM authentication. But in reality, it is the iOS devices that has been at the forefront of this. It's also a matter of the ecosystem, how it is different. iOS is only one company. It is Apple. We talk to one. Talk yeah. to one. And Android is a lot of the... <laughs> I know, <laughs> but, but, but there's a lot of different implementation. And it's also even how the operator is procuring and buying this. So for instance, one operator may buy their devices, their handsets in bulk from big distributors. Then you don't have a way to say, put this, put this, but it's almost like you're buying a car. I want power windows, I want this and all that. So the, the software in these Android devices can usually, they can do it, but they haven't necessarily checked the option, this is what I want it to be done. Whereas other operators that are saying, any single device that I sell, I talk to the device vendors, I talk to Samsung, make sure it works this, 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 and then it works beautifully. Uh, so that's something still left for the industry to shape up on. I really, almost like a call to the industry, you need yeah. to shape up on this a little bit. And, uh, but, but at the same time, we know, everybody in the industry know that there's going to be different generations of capabilities. And that's why we as a company, we're trying to help the operators saying that this is a safe bet working with us because number one, the existing guys that don't support Hotspot 2.0, we have ways to take care of them. We have ways to make those work anyways. Now there's these devices that can do pieces of Hotspot 2.0 and we will help them to get onto your network. And then for those that can do the full implementation, we can do that, and then even for the future. So we're trying to make sure, tell the operators, well, we want to help you get 100% of your devices to use Wi-Fi in a convenient way for the users. And, and, but it's going to be for different, various ways for them, unfortunately. If you have to just very quickly to put a weight on how much is a network implementation, uh, putting the brakes on hotspot.0 implementation on the handsets, which one is you know, it's having more difficulties to adapt to this new reality, or which needs to work fastest to catch up with the other one. Network or handsets? I, I think from a product availability point of view, it's the handsets and devices. Uh, and it's kind of interesting. For our business. But, uh, for our business. Yeah. but there is also in some cases, an operator that may have deployed a lot of Wi-Fi access points. And they may have a challenge because they need to upgrade it. And if it's not software upgradable, then you're in trouble. It's similar to the LTE and the 3G HSPA. I mean, the yeah. guys that did the first generation of HSPA, if that's not software upgradable, yeah. then it's going to be more difficult to but, replace but it. How often does a person change a domestic router? Maybe 18 months, 24 months? It Ever? depends, it depends. I, I agree with uh, Torn Bjorn that right now I see this trend in, in the operators that they have this massive legacy network yeah. that they are not IPSIM capable or they are not hotspot auto capable. It's really hard for them to upgrade the networks in, yeah. in a short period of time. So it's, it's a large investment, so it's going to take time. So what we are seeing the, on, uh, as a trend, operators start to deploy hotspot auto in the new venues. Yes. yes. So as they start to, do, to continue to deploy hotspots, or they can upgrade on the key location. So 
I have these 10 hotspots where I have a huge amount of traffic, so I can upgrade these locations. Yeah. So I don't yeah. need to upgrade to the entire those, network. Yeah. 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 Now, I was going to discuss Spectrum, but let me just, because we're running out of time, right. to go directly to another phenomenon which I think is more important for the Wi-Fi implementation, which is Wi-Fi on the community right. component of it. Uh, let me know what you are seeing in the market, and <coughs> we're seeing some operators launching their own initi initiatives, and we have some companies like Fon, which is the most widely known, but we, we have some other uh, companies doing the same thing, yeah. uh, doing that community Wi-Fi. Tell me, how do you see this matter? Yeah, I can tell you a few trends. So, first trend, cable operators, broadband operators, fixed broadband operators are looking to Wi-Fi community as a huge opportunity. It's it's easy, it's not, doesn't it's require, that's a, that's a it's easy. Okay. It's not, doesn't require, require a huge investment yeah. because the infrastructure is deployed. If, if your core of the network is capable of manage the, 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 the entire network and support this public uh, network, it's easy, like I said. And, <laughs> and um, there is another trend that is from the typical public locations like hotels, airports, that there have been always the key locations for public Wi-Fi. They are becoming more interesting in explored Wi-Fi by themselves. So there is this trend, and you see on, on our membership as well, that so large hotel chain, hotels chains, they, chain, want, to they want to become, sort of. not, not an operator, but they want to explore mm -hmm. the experience and whatever services that can deliver on their premises. Yeah. Because on top of internet access, you can start to deploy other services, like information services. So imagine that you are on a shopping mall. You, I can deliver throughout the Wi-Fi network information about promotions, mm -hmm. advertisement. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, these type of services are very on the core of the business of the venue owner, and yeah. they want to control that. So operators, uh, they see that these public locations are more difficult to manage, so they look as well to the Wi-Fi community as, as an alternative. And mm -hmm. today, we have members that are launching 10 million hotspots at once. 10 million? 10 million. In one market? In one market. Because it's easy for them, they have the infrastructure, they have this amount of customers, they just have to prepare the core of the network, and then they suddenly they pop up all these mm -hmm. hotspots in all the network that they have. It's, it's an it's a absolutely astonishing, beautiful opportunity. And I think, I think if you look at the fixed operators that can provide what you're talking about, there's an even greater advantage for those that have fiber connectivity. Because in reality, if you look at those that have been rolling out fiber, many of them really have gigabit capacity all the way out to the endpoints. <clears throat> so if they're selling today for the private consumer 100 megabit per second, there's 900 megabits per second to be used for something different. And if you actually combine that with the new Wi-Fi standards of 802.11ac, which is also now coming into the uh, devices, I mean, there's certain laptops, certain tablets that are starting to do this. <clears throat> it's absolutely tremendous because you can have five, 600 megabits per second and actually provide this, and that's a tremendous add-on to it. Uh, uh, but there are, at the same time, a number of DSL operators that may have copper and they may not have the best copper quality. No, they have a challenge because out of the uh, 10, 15 megabits, can I give two megabits? It's not going to be an astonishing number. Yeah. Uh, but I'm thinking two megabits but compared it's, to whatever I might get from a 3G. Oh, connection. absolutely. Depending on where you are in the world, there are countries yeah. in, in the. In, 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 in America, for example. Absolutely, the, the, well, that would be tremendous. I mean, that's what you can hardly get out of a 3G, so it's going to be a very, very good one. We have customers in, in Brazil that are deploying this, like OI, and in areas where they're deploying it, they haven't had a chance to build out 3G yet. No. So it, this is the internet access they can get. Now, what's the business model for, for a mobile operator in, in the community wise? Like, because we're talking about the fixed operators. Absolutely. And we're seeing, as we were saying, can, company launching 10 million yeah. hotspots because yeah. we see the future of yeah. Is there anything for mobile operators in, in this oh. community Wi-Fi phenomenon or they are kind of no, 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 it is. I mean, a lot of the mobile operators have both fixed arms 
and the mobile arm, and many operate, mobile operators have acquired uh, fiber companies so that they can actually get fiber out to their 3G and 4G base stations. Uh, but those that are purely mobile operators, I think the best way there is to interact and buy or partner with other network capacities, you know, people that actually have the, the millions. I mean, 10 million is a lot, but there are, uh, you know, even, even tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands, and even up to a million is a, is a great, great addition. And, and to partner with that. And they can do it beautifully by getting one additional SSID and it will be an identity that the device can identify and connect automatically or it can be the other partner. They have their own network name and you can roam between them. So there are ways yeah, to do it. And, and, and uh, Tom Bjorn, just like you said, I think there are three major advantages of the point this Wi-Fi community for the mobile oh, operator. Right. So one is you can reach locations where you don't have a proper uh, 3G service, for example, like you said, yeah. like countries, Likewise. like yeah. Oi, Brazil, yeah. and other countries. Then you can, in any country, you, with Wi-Fi community, you can support indoor coverage. That yeah. is another Everywhere. bottleneck that exists everywhere. So in certain locations, inside, I don't know, a certain division of your home, you don't have mobile coverage. So Wi-Fi community can help on that. The third one is, um, network optimization. So you can think of, of this community Wi-Fi as well as one more layer on the different kinds of networks that you have, like 2G, 3G, LTE, and then you can have this one more that can help you out on to make your network deployments uh, optimization in terms of, of investments and, and CapEx investments. So I think this free uh, um, advantage Many cars are looking very serious to it, and yeah. that's why we are looking, seeing today lots of deployments in terms of Wi-Fi community. Well, Tiago, Tom Bjorn, thank you so much for uh, being here today, uh, answering my questions, and uh, good luck with the rest of the show. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rafael.